In fact, it has been remarked by some that Hobbit's only real passion is for food. A rather unfair observation, as we have also developed a keen interest in the brewing of ales and the smoking of pipeweed. But where our hearts truly lie is in peace, quiet, and good till the Hello, I'm Nicholas John. And I'm Nick Andrew. And we come to you live from the Green Dragon. So this episode of our prologue series, uh, we are going to start looking at the peoples of Middle-earth. Today, in this moment, we're going to talk about some of the main characters in the narrative, the hobbits. Hobbit is a word or a name some may have heard before. So, Nicholas, do you want to shed some light on what a hobbit is? Hobbits are like people, but they only grow to be half size. So depending on which culture the hobbits in the story come in contact with, they're called halflings or hobbits. Or an even older form in Rohan is the word Holbitla, which is probably where the hobbits get their name from. And the, the word in Old English, which we are going to assume is the foundation of the Rohiric language, means hole builder, or one who builds holes. So the hobbits are hole builders. Ah, oh, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. So hole builders, specifically the hobbits that settled the Shire, and I'm not going to dive into what the different branches of hobbits would have potentially lived in, but once we have all three families of hobbits settle the Shire, one of the most popular housing methods they use is actually building holes. And I don't mean like a a soggy, oozy, wet hole with icky smells. I mean like picture like an underground house built into the side of a hill and a beautiful round door. Very, very round verbiage is used when describing what the inside of a hobbit hole looks like. So the doors are round. We know the doors are round. We know the doorknob is in the center of the door for Bag End, which is one of the most prominent places that we visit in the Shire. That's where Hole Builder would come from. And because it does have origination in Rohiric, logic dictates that that may have been the way they did it all along. Where are they now and where did they come from? I mentioned it a second ago, the Shire. Um, The Shire is a place, if you're looking at a map in Middle-earth, and those of you listening, we will have kind of a a PDF, we'll give you whether a link or a file, um, of what Middle-earth looks like. When you're looking at Middle-earth, the northwestern corner, just east of the Blue Mountains, you see a place called the Shire. And the Shire is split into four farthings, east, north, west, south. That's probably the weirdest way to list the cardinal directions, don't judge. (laughs) Uh, But that's where the hobbits settle, that's where they're from, that's where the hobbits that we meet throughout the narrative, that's where they come from. That's not where hobbits came from, though. We have three different types of hobbits that we know for sure that are the ancestors of the hobbits that settled the Shire. We have the Harfoots, we have the Stewers, and we have the Harfoots, the Stewers, and the Fallahides. And uh, the Harfoots came over the Misty Mountains first. So those of you looking at the map, a little further to the east of the Shire is a line of mountains going north to south. Uh, Those are the Misty Mountains. We know the Harfoots came over the mountains first. The Stewers, if you go south... Across the mountains and south a bit, there's the river Anduin. It kind of scrolls through across, kind of west to east, and then down south, down straight into into Gondor, and out to the ocean. The Vales of Anduin are actually prominent later in the narrative. Spoiler alert. The Stewards lived on the Anduin River. We know that. We know Smeagol, who later is known as Gollum. Spoiler alert. Was a Stewer, or is believed to have been a Stewer. It's largely then assumed that they had contact with Rohan, which is where they got the name Holbitla, or Holbitla, from what we were mentioning before, Holbuilder. And then we have the Fallowhides, which all we really know about them that's worth mentioning is that they lived with and or had a good relationship with the elves of Middle-earth. So Harfoots, Stewers, Fallowhides. And they all moved to the uh, western half of Middle-earth across the Misty Mountains and settled the Shire good halfway through the third age and it might be worth mentioning now um and you can correct me if i'm wrong that in the narrative of the book it is speculated that smeagol is a hobbit and even outside of the narrative in the in the letters 
Tolkien never officially says, but everything he says about about Gollum, about Smeagol, leads us towards the answer that yes, he is indeed a hobbit who has been mangled through time to something that doesn't quite resemble a hobbit. Right. We know he's of similar stature mm-hmm. to the hobbits. Um, in his decrepit form, we know he's similar stature. And he, the, the specific term they use is river folk. Ah. He's one of the river folk. And so then when we learn that the Stewars lived on the Anduin River, they were probably fishing society, perhaps. Um, speculation. It, it's reasonable to extrapolate that he was a Stewar. Right. And another clue is that when Gollum uses the ring... It works on him in much the same way it works on Bilbo and Frodo. Right. That's important, too. Another thing I'd want to mention, um, we know that Isildur, when he was killed in possession of the ring, was in the river Anduin. Mm. That's where he died. He died in the river. And when Smeagol and Deagol find the ring, well, accurately, when Deagol finds the ring, he finds it in the Anduin River. Right. Because it's not like the ring is going to get up and move to a different river. And with what you were saying earlier, the river folk possibly fishing in the movie, we see Deagle in the boat fishing and, and Smeagol is on the shore. Was he in the shore or was he in the boat with him? They were both in the boat. They're both in the boat. Okay. So, but they were in the boat fishing. The reason Deagle even finds it is he falls in the water and, and sees something shiny. Right. Yes. And it's my birthday, precious. Give us a gift. So. (laughs) <laughs> tell us a little bit about the we're going to come back to this so let's not dwell on it too much but let's talk a little bit about the shire how long have the hobbits been there and and kind of what it looks like and what do they do there uh what kind of people are they so the shire is a a green rolling hill type country it's the type of place that tolkien himself pictured the the english countryside to be like it's the it's the countryside of his childhood and it was quite idyllic the way it's written and and the people there are are good soft-hearted hard-working hands in the dirt sort of people they'd farmers they were gardeners they were beer makers pipeweed was a yes. good a good good pastime uh, smoking pipeweed was good yep yeah you you hit the nail right on the head there like hands in the dirt like they like a good hard day's work so much so they eat how many meals in a day? We have we have breakfast, second breakfast, elevensies, luncheon, afternoon tea, dinner, and then supper. Yes. So breakfast, second breakfast, elevensies, luncheon, afternoon tea, dinner, supper. Whew, that's a lot of food in a day for such shorties. That's that's a lot of calories. I don't know if we want to inject that much realism here, but <laughs> chances are they were pretty hard working people cuz they ate a lot. And if any of you have done work on a farm, you know how hungry you are at the end of that day. Holy cow. The word feast is adequate. Mhm. Well, and you also mentioned like how long have they been there? So we're talking about what they like to do. They like to, you know, good tilled earth and hands in the dirt and mm-hmm. brewing and smoking and Jolly merriment. We know they settled in the Shire in roughly the the 1600s of the Third Age. Mm-hmm. And when we meet the Hobbits in the War of the Ring, which is what takes place during the Lord of the Rings. I'm not going to talk about the Hobbit right now, but the, the Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. We meet the Hobbits in the, the, the 3000s, the early 3000s of the Third Age. So they've been there for well over a millennium. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is their home. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's a lot of time to develop a, a, a culture, a lot of time to develop a way of life. You know, it's a, mm-hmm. it's a very slow-paced, steady way of life. Which is one thing, that Gandalf really loves that about the, the Hobbits. Very steady. Very steady place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Gandalf in the story is, is one of the very few outsiders to be uh, mixed up in the silly Hobbit people as his Saruman, who is his, the leader of his order... You know, he he doesn't really understand why why do you even bother with these with these people? But what Gandalf knows is that the hobbits, not only are they you know, they're pleasant people, they're proper they're they're proper and you have to kind of think of them as the way Tolkien would have pictured good English folk, even though I don't want to put too much of that on it. 
But what they're particularly good at is their resilience to darkness and evil. They are, and it's it's a passive trait that they have. They don't even try to do this. It's just bred into them. Oh yeah, like they're they're so rooted. Like you look at you look at a culture and you look at the way they live and you look at the way men might live and the way we live today and then you look at a culture that's built itself like the Shire. You're talking deep roots, unshakable roots in this way of life that's very laid back, very at one with the earth. I mean, which even goes back to the way they live in their hobbit holes. They actually live in the earth. And uh, like you mentioned, resilience. Uh, We know some of our our cardinal characters here, uh, hobbits, extraordinary resilience to the effects of the ring, to quote Elrond from the films. It comes from that deep-rooted sense of being that hobbits have. Yep. We know from Gollum and Bilbo and Frodo that when they use the ring, their own powers are enhanced. And one of those powers is their ability to walk silently. And even amongst elves, who are notorious for being able to be quiet and and sneak up on people, they are quiet to them. And indeed, in in the prologue of The Lord of the Rings, if you are reading concerning hobbits, it talks about how all all these magic folk are possibly still around but you'll never see them because they'll they'll hear you blundering through the countryside way before you'll ever see them and they're quiet enough that you'll never ever hear them so this is one of the this becomes important especially in the hobbit but is is part of why the ring works the way it does on the hobbits themselves well and and you mentioned sneaking around and being able to walk silently i want to talk about their feet a little bit okay because hobbit feet most of you listening may have heard whether you've read the lord of the rings or the hobbit before or seen the films you've undoubtedly heard someone reference hobbit feet hobbit feet they're big we mentioned they're like three foot six roughly average size for a hobbit i'd wager their feet are bigger than most of ours Mm, probably and we're fully grown i myself am six feet tall nick you're taller than me a little bit their feet are probably bigger than ours they're big they're hairy and they've got very leathery soles very leathery hobbits don't wear shoes no matter where they are no matter what the temperature might be they don't wear shoes because their soles are so leathery and they've got so much hair it's kind of gross i don't like feet they've got so much hair that they just don't need it so this this helps them with the moving silently so i wager it probably would help them swim faster too if they weren't afraid of the water exactly which makes the stewards so special Mm. what about a king like we know kings and queens and leaders and mayors and stewards and uh what what do the hobbits have nick do they do they don't have a king no there's no king in fact most of their most of their cultural arrangement seems unordered they just ha- they are a collection of people who are content to to work and to support each other you know through their work whether it's growing the food or preparing the food or or whatever their job is so as far as official leaders there's the mayor whose home is in Mickle Delving who is an elective representative elective leader of of the shire officially so if things go wrong or if mm-hmm. there's an attack it's the mayor who has to make state decisions. Right. And then there's the Thane, who is the head of the Took family over in Tookborough. And Tookborough is a giant... It didn't start out giant, but it became this giant kind of city house thing where the Took family, who is just a, a very notable family, made their home and grew up. And they just added more smiles, more houses, more rooms. And it became a city unto itself. I always picture it a little bit like an anthill, but... Yes. Those of you that have played The Lord of the Rings online, that's almost what it looks like. Oh, really? Yeah, Tuckboro is this huge hill, and it's just hobbit hole upon hobbit hole upon hobbit hole upon... you looking from a distance, it looks like a giant anthill. Going back. So, as far as the settling of the Shire, roughly the middle of the Third Age, is when we have the Shire founded by Bree Hobbits whose names were Marcho and Blanco. They were gifted to them by the king of Arthedain, which is where that land existed at the time. So these two hobbits were gifted this plot of land, Mm. and then the rest of the hobbits came and slowly settled. What we now know 
fourteen hundred plus years later as the Shire. Okay. Yes. Let's go back That's and important. talk about Bree a little bit. Talk about Bree. Yeah, oh, Bree, Lord in heaven. Bree is is Bree is kind of on the borders of the Shire. Um, it's they treat themselves like they're not in the Shire, but it's close enough that maybe it's in the Shire. Is it right. officially out? I think it's officially in, right? Well, it's in quote unquote Bree Land. Oh yeah, that's right. Bree Land is its own little place. Yeah, yeah it, it, but it's like it's like a spot. Um, right. And there's Archit and then what's the other one? Bree, Archit, Staddle. Staddle. Uh, Staddle is there. And that's kind of around a, a hill also, right? Or is there like you Staddle? Yes. You've also got Comb. Oh yeah. Mhm. Um and Bree Bree Land is like on the it's along the Great Road and the Greenway uh, where these two very prominent roads in this area of Middle Earth intersect is where yeah. Bree exists. It's a crossroad. And it, what's special about Bree is that it is a town inhabited both by men and hobbits seamlessly. They're they're both there, they're both important, and they also as a society, as Bree folk, they take pride in this in this communion between them and their uniqueness in the world. Right. Well, and they've got a lot of Kind of, you look at Bree and that little section of Bree land, which is in and of itself a little section of Middle Earth. There's a lot of there's a lot of land around it, so we know it's on a crossroad. We know it's on the two two big roads, uh, the Great Road and the Greenway. Um, you've got the Midwater Marsh right next to it. You've got the Chetwood Forest a little northeast. You've got the Barrow Downs to its west, and you've got the South Downs below it. And then around it, I'd imagine, is probably landscape similar to what we see in the Shire proper. So it's very, very diverse landscape, for one. And because it's on such a prominent roadway, I mean, you're going to have, there's dwarves in the Blue Mountains. There, we know there are elves to the east. There's going to be a lot of, quote, strange folk about, end quote, you know, when, you're, when you're, you're looking at Bree. So, and we know that one of the big prominent locations in Bree that we encounter is the Inn of the Prancic Pony which is featured in both trilogies, the Lord of the Rings films and the Hobbit films. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but that's Bree. And like you mentioned, Hobbits live there. There are Bree Hobbits. Bree Hobbits are a real thing. Not all Hobbits exist in the Shire. Granted, by the end of the Third Age, we know that the majority of Hobbits in Middle-earth live in the Shire. Bree Hobbits are still a thing. You could call them city Hobbits. Okay. With how vastly different their lifestyle is from Shire Hobbits. So, well, what are what are some famous hobbits? Like, we've talked about hobbits and hobbits we're going to mention, and we've thrown names around like crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are what are some of the big famous hobbits that we're going to meet in this storyline? Just so, if nothing else, we've got the names out there. Right. Okay. Well, first off, there's Bilbo. Bilbo is the main character of The Hobbit, and truth be told, when I, I read The Hobbit first, and then I, when I went to read... Lord of the Rings, I was rather disappointed that Bilbo was not the main character because I had fallen in love with him in The Hobbit. But there's good reasons. First of all, Bilbo is quite old by the time the story of The Lord of the Rings kicks off, and he, at the, in the very first chapter we're going to read, he is celebrating his 111th birthday. 111st. Yes, his 111st birthday. And that's quite old. And he, in in Hobbit culture, that's a very respectable age. Age is important for them. Yeah, respect comes by default with age in Hobbit culture. And and Bilbo is quite proud to reach his age because he surpasses some of the oldest of Hobbits in in their history. And Hobbits will tell you about their family histories all day long and all week long if you let them. So it's very important. They they keep all of this stuff in, in their minds and they tell the stories over and over so everybody knows their story, their history, their family. So these are important things. And Bilbo, at the beginning of, of Lord of the Rings, it is told that he adopts his nephew, Frodo. You want to tell us a little bit about Frodo? Oh, Frodo Baggins. Frodo Baggins. Um, so we know Bilbo... Did not like the idea of, obviously he's not married, he does not have a significant other, he doesn't have his own children. Uh, what we do know is Frodo's parents died, and we know he was a cousin of Bilbo's. And we know Bilbo wanted to take him in because he sensed a sort of adventurous nature in Frodo. And that Frodo was not like the others. 
the others being other hobbits, other Shire hobbits. Like Bilbo himself found out he was in the adventure he had with Gandalf through the Hobbit storyline. Um, so he, he has a special place in his heart for Frodo, and he takes him in and names him his heir, which actually really irritates some other hobbits that we meet, um, called the Sackville Bagginses, or Sackville Baggins family. Uh, and these are relatives of Bilbo's. Do you want to tell us a little bit about these fantastic relatives? <laughs> um, well, this couple, Lotho and Lobelia, Sackville Baggins. At the end of The Hobbit, Bilbo shows up seemingly miraculously, just as his house is being auctioned off as he is presumed to be dead. The rightful heirs are the Sack- Sackville Bagginses. After Bilbo shoes everybody away and tries to get all of his stuff back, he notices that some spoons are missing. And it's it is silver spoons. Silver spoons, yes. And it is highly suspected by Bilbo that it is Lobelia who has taken them. And she is very sour about not inheriting Bag End. Um, this is a very prominent home, very prominent smile. It's just a, one of the luxury houses, luxury smiles in the town. But because one, Bilbo doesn't die in fact he doesn't seem to age and two now he's adopted frodo they're never gonna get the house they are very sour and sackville baggins they are relatives Mm -hmm. yeah so they are the next ones in line they're the they're the heirs until frodo steps in and create an issue for them so and we mentioned frodo so much because frodo is actually arguably the primary character or one of the most prominent characters in the Lord of the Rings novel or series, if you're reading the the three different volumes separately. Um, So Frodo we see a lot of, uh, more so than we saw Bilbo even in the Hobbit narrative. But there's good news for Bilbo fans. Uh, Bilbo is featured in the Lord of the Rings story. Uh, You do see Bilbo. He kind of bookends the storyline. Spoiler alert. So you will get to see Bilbo again. This I promise you. The way that the story is written, you jump back and forth between main characters. And sometimes, at least for me, the first time I read it, it wasn't obvious that perhaps the primary character changes, depending on what part of the book you're in. It wasn't revealed to me until much later, when I had a brain enough to notice it, that someone else was taking the, the narrative lead in the late stages of the book. So we'll come to that when we need to come to that. Uh, how about Sam? Oh, Sam Gamgee. Sam Wise Gamgee. He's a gardener for the the Baggins family. He and his father, and uh, probably their whole family, has been gardeners or landskeepers for the Baggins family at Bag End for what we're led to believe is a very long time. Uh, So Sam is essentially Frodo's gardener. Uh, But Sam, what can I say about Sam? Roast chicken. That's what I can say about Sam. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he is one of the most loyal figures in, dare I say it, literature. Mm. I'll say modern literature to appease. He's one of the most loyal figures we will ever encounter. Uh, his devotion to Frodo is one of the most inspiring things, because he, he devotes his, his entire being to Frodo completely and utterly over his own well-being at some points in the narrative. And... Mm. It just goes to show you the quality of character there because he recognizes the mission and he recognizes the importance of someone other than himself and it's a non-issue for him. There's no wrestling with it. It just is. And so Sam is someone that we see a lot of because he happens on the overarching narrative somewhat accidentally. Mm -hmm. He gets involved and uh, becomes one of the fan favorites, I would say. Mm-hmm. For the entire series. So, and that's Samwise Gamgee. So we meet we meet Gaffer Gamgee, which if you listen to our recasting episode, episode zero, we talk about Gaffer Gamgee. He's like old man Gamgee. That's, that's Samwise's father. So we do meet him as well. And then there are two other super prominent hobbits. In the storyline, yeah. Mary Addock, Brandy Buck, Mary, and Peregrine Took, known as Pippin. And we took talked about the great smiles... At Tookborough, uh, that's the family that Pippin belongs to, which is a prominent family. Which I was gonna, I was gonna ask you about this. Does Pippin hold a, a higher position in the society because he is directly related to the to the Took line, or is he? Is that just a 
is part of a prominent family and no big deal. I think... I mean, he's young. The thing about Mary and Pippin is that they're both young. They're both underaged. Right. So they're both... I mean, in, in Hobbit society, we didn't even talk about this. You don't come of age until you're 33. And they're somewhere in their 20s. The troublesome 20s. Right. So we, we know Peregrine is the son of Paladin Took II. Um, so Pippin slash Peregrine, nickname. Um, his father is Paladin Took. And during the War of the Ring, a lot, a lot of things go down in the Shire. Um, but Paladin, at the time, is the legitimate thane of Tuckborough. So he is the legitimate thane. So if you want an analogy to go by, Pippin is kind of a, a hobbit prince, yeah, as it were. Yeah, but they don't, they don't have proper kings, queens, princes, princesses, no. that kind of stuff. But the prominence of that family really plays into his position um he would be right. looked to with that kind of uh star quality a little bit they would know who he is and and what he is even if they don't know him personally right and that that draws even more uh, i would say draws more attention and significance to pippin's development throughout the series you're looking at the frivolous heir to you know being the thrain of tuckborough slowly maturing over the course of this storyline so those of you that may have read this before and those of you who have never read it before i would argue pay specific attention to pippin's development because he's important to the shire and it's it's fascinating to single out one character and watch their development it's really hard in a story like this where we're given a fellowship and we're supposed to pay attention to all these storylines and all these characters development all at once but I would say if you want to pay attention to one person and really get an interesting development storyline, look at Pippin, because it's cool. Yeah. Mary, we don't know as much about because he doesn't come from such a prominent family, but he is a particularly good friend of Pippin, and both of them are good friends to Frodo. So Frodo's a little bit older than the other two, but the three of them together are quite good friends. Sam, as an employee of the house... Not exactly. He's known to them, but he doesn't like run about with them in the same way. So the the four of them are close in age, but there is a slight separation in each of their statuses. Right. Yeah, we've got the heir of the eccentric in Frodo. We've got the gardener in Sam. We've got the, again, this is an analogy. We've got the princeling, Pippin. And then we've got the... Kind of the everybody... Every every day we know nothing about like Mary's descendants. We know nothing about it. There's nothing of prominence that we're ever given. We just know he's Mariadoc Brandybuck of Buckland. He is known in the countryside because he he goes about and meets with other people, but he is not. He doesn't seem to have any social status above the average Hobbit. So right, and he is a troublemaker. Yeah. He and Pippin get into trouble uh, pretty often, and I, I suspect that Frodo get wrap, gets wrapped up in that sometimes. Right. You know, in the troublesome 20s. Mm. And how Bullroar took, rode a horse, an actual horse, not a pony, and led in a little war. Like, what was it, goblins? Against goblins? Yeah. I think, I think it's goblins. And there's a, a cute little little joke about the game of golf and, and severing a, a goblin's head in one fell swoop. You know, but that's Bullroar Took. We know that. We know Bullroar Took is an ancestor of Bilbo, and it's a Took, so it's clearly an ancestor of Pippin. So there's a little tie together with how perhaps Frodo and Pippin know each other. Uh, and then we're also treated by the physical presence of Everard Proudfoot. Nick, uh, you should you should tell us about Mr. Proudfoot. Uh, if you listen to our episode zero, we bring up Everard Proudfoot. He is particularly notable in the movies. When Bilbo is giving his birthday speech, he lists off the different clans of hobbits. And when he gets to Proudfoot's, Everard is pictured with his big foot way up <laughs> in the front of the shot on top of the table where they're all eating, by the way. And he shouts out, Proud Feet! My favorite thing about that is that it, it plays back to the old Lord of the Rings animated film. That oh, is yeah? The, that, that exact same thing happens. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, and Peter Jackson made it a point to include that. Like, the, the exact frame 
is there down to the proud feet. So it was a neat little homage to what had come before. Okay. I did not know that part, actually. That's interesting. Oh, it's so cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so he is a, he's just notable. All right, so I think that about closes off uh, what we wanted to cover for episode 0.2 of our prologue series, uh, The Peoples of Middle-Earth. This time we talked about hobbits. Nick, did you have any other comments or things you wanted to add? No, other than the the Shire is one of those places that I would always love to visit. It's it's definitely kind of my idyllic my idyllic homeland, I guess I would say. I, I just have to point out to you that if you go to certain websites, you can book a Shire themed vacation trip to New Zealand. <gasps> okay. Dreams. Podcast Dreams. goals right there. Done. Maybe ooh. If any of you would be interested in taking a Shire-themed vacation with the Knicks, you should let us know. Especially if you're going to foot the bill. Hobbit foot the bill? Did you did you have anything else you wanted to add other than that? No, I had nothing else to add. So thank you all for joining us for episode 0.2 of Green Dragon Live. Again, there is definitely more to come. Please go to our website, greendragonlive.com, where you can find out all about the show and what we're trying to do. You can also subscribe to our newsletter where you get show notes and everything else. And please don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Green Dragon Live. Shoot us your questions, comments, uh, if you have any suggestions, feelings of regret, uh, please use the hashtag GDLive. Or visit our page on Facebook at facebook.com slash greendragonlive. I do also want to give a shout out to Harry Morrell for our beautiful intro slash outro music. Uh, you can find more of his work at youtube.com slash Harry Morrell. Morrell with two R's and two L's. Thanks again for listening. I'm Nicholas John. I'm Vic Andrew. Join us next time when we are live from the Green Dragon. And as the hobbits would say, good day. No adventure here, good day.